You're invited to listen to Inside Schizophrenia, a new podcast brought to you by PsychCentral.com, home of a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to Inside Schizophrenia, a look into better understanding and living well with schizophrenia. Hosted by renowned advocate and influencer Rachel Star Withers and featuring Gabe Howard. Listeners, could a change in your schizophrenia treatment plan make a difference? There are options out there you might not know about. Visit oncemonthlydifference.com to find out more about the benefits of once monthly injections for adults with schizophrenia. Welcome to Inside Schizophrenia. I'm Rachel Star Withers here with Gabe Howard. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look into violence and schizophrenia. Is violence an actual symptom of schizophrenia? Do mass attackers always have schizophrenia? Basically, are schizophrenics dangerous? This is fascinating because it comes up so incredibly often. And I imagine that as somebody who lives with schizophrenia, people that believe this particular misinformation campaign or, or myth or misunderstanding sort of visit their fears onto your life. Is that fair? Yes. I'm very open about my schizophrenia, not just online and in podcasts, but everyday life. Okay. Most people who meet me as far as more than once, not just random strangers, and I'm just screaming it out. Um, but if you work <laughs> with me, you probably know at some point. And I get a lot of different like crazy questions. Some people have asked me like, well, do you see colors? And I'm like, yes, I'm not colorblind. That has nothing to do with schizophrenia <laughs> at all. Um, but the weirdest I've gotten that I've never quite understand why is, have you ever killed anyone? And and do they just do they just straight up when they're asking questions about schizophrenia? Do they come straight out and say, "Have you killed anyone?" No, this is like something they lead up to. Like it's it's like okay, I've been like I know her, you know, and we're we're finally talking. And maybe I feel like I can finally ask this question. That would be offensive if I asked right away, but I've definitely been thinking about it for the past three weeks. I've been working with her. <laughs> So it's on their mind from the moment they find out that you have schizophrenia. I mean, when they find out about your illness, this is something that pops into their head almost instantly. I personally think so. And does it worry you? Is it a concern? To me, it doesn't worry me. Um, I always like to turn it into a joke. People say, have you ever killed anyone? Not yet. I just like to just <laughs> kind of pause there for a long time. Take a nice deep breath and slowly turn my gaze to them. It's great. Um, but, but that's I, something that you have, of course, the privilege to do. Yes. I, I mean, to, yes. you know, just just both by way of being, I, I'm trying not to say a, a tiny little white woman, but but you, you know what I mean? You you don't look physically imposing. Does does that make sense? No, it I does. Mean, if, yes. if, you were, if you were a giant man, if you were, yes. you, you know, a, a giant African-American male or... But if you weren't as articulate or funny or as approachable or as friendly, this kind of a stereotype would be, it, it could be really impactful to your ability to find work or a job or housing if they think that you're dangerous. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, people hear the word stigma and you always associate it with something bad. Like, okay, well, stigma must mean that everybody thinks schizophrenics are violent or have killed people. But I think a lot of it is also, you just don't know anything. Like the unknown. Like, I don't know what this person is capable of. I don't know much about schizophrenia. So yeah, on such and such TV show, that was the killer. And that I think is more scary than anything. So you think that people are taking their, their ignorance essentially because they don't know if you are safe or unsafe. Yes. And it's one reason that I go out of my way to be so open about my schizophrenia. And that's a luxury that I have. You know, certain jobs... I can't go around saying that if I were to work. So I'm not saying everybody with a mental disorder should, you know, just tell the world, hey, guess what? I mean, right now I'm working on this podcast with you, Gabe, Inside Schizophrenia. I don't think I would get fired if anyone found out I actually had schizophrenia. In this particular case, it, it was an advantage. Obviously, the show was looking for somebody who had a lot of knowledge about schizophrenia, somebody who was open to... Uh, talking about schizophrenia and somebody who was living publicly with schizophrenia. Do you believe, Rachel, that the people who think this are just mean, malicious people who just dislike you? You, you sort of alluded to the fact that you think that it's just all misunderstanding. I'm not going to say all of it's misunderstanding. Um, 
there's horrible people all over the world who are going to believe whatever they want. But I'd say the majority of it, the people who've actually asked me the question, you know, have you ever killed anyone? They weren't mean people. It was just kind of like someone who was genuinely curious and honestly didn't know anything about schizophrenia, really, except for the media. Once you do your humor thing, and, and I agree with you, I, I think that humor has a lot of benefits. It diffuses situations. It, it makes people comfortable in a way. After that sort of dissipates and people are like, okay, now I've realized that accusing you of killing somebody or, or even thinking that can, can be really hurtful. Do good conversations come out of that? And how do you handle those? I usually like to follow that with, actually, people with schizophrenia are more likely to be the victim of a crime than to be committing the crime. And people be like, oh, really? Like, and that's just kind of like, oh, they'll like completely kind of change their thoughts. Like, I just had no clue. And I'm like, yeah. So it's a nice little segue into some fun learning. (laughs) When you say that people with schizophrenia are more likely to be the victim of a crime, do people believe you? Do they give pushback? Do they ask why that is? No one in real life has ever challenged me on that. Definitely over uh, the internet, people write, well, that's just stupid, or I don't see how that's possible. Or they'll say, well, schizophrenics hurt lots of people. And I just say, again, that goes back to kind of, not all of it's ignorance, it's just refusing to want to look at facts and believe what is true. I think that everybody in America understands why comforting lies are better than uncomfortable truths Mm -hmm. in the short term. I would rather have somebody tell me that I'm completely right and I don't have to change. That's really, really easy. But of course, you you can't grow and be open to new experiences. And the danger of believing these things about people with schizophrenia is that you may be avoiding a diagnosis yourself. Because after all, if you believe that all people with schizophrenia are violent and you think that you might have it, you're thinking to yourself, I'm not violent, therefore I don't have to go get help. You could think this about a loved one. You could think, oh my god, I'm really worried about my son, daughter, niece, nephew, brother, sister, best friend, but they would never hurt a fly. So I'm not going to get them a diagnosis. I'm not going to take them in. How does that strike you? Back years ago, the very first time I sat my parents down and I told them, look, I have went to the doctor and this is what happened. I've been diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia. My mother did not want me to tell anybody, like anybody. When I made the first video I did about schizophrenia, she was mortified. (laughs) And uh, she repeatedly was like, you can't talk about this, Rachel. And she was so scared that I was going to get kicked out of college, that no one would ever hire me, that people would be scared of me. It was just pretty much, you're never going to get married. You're never going to have a job. You're never going to finish school. All of those things weren't real reasons for her to think that. It was just she was frightened of what that word labeled on me, you know, what it would do when other people saw that label. So she was more concerned about the reactions of the general public than she was about the illness that you were battling. Yes. That does add an extra layer though, right? If everybody thinks that you, and then by extension your family, are violent or dangerous or scary, that makes it that much harder to get care. Because like you said, you're your family's initial thought was, okay, how do we manage this information? It wasn't, how do we manage the illness? And I think whenever you have something like a mental illness versus a physical illness, you know, some sort of disorders and whatnot obviously run in families. But if you hear, oh, well, that person, their daughter has schizophrenia, they kind of tend to think, oh, I bet the whole family's crazy. My parents never came out and said it, but I think they were worried that if people found out I had schizophrenia, they were going to assume my brother did also. So I'm not only potentially ruining my life, but I could be ruining my little brother's life because, well, if she has it, why doesn't he? And it is, it's a very scary diagnosis to get. And if you aren't used to anything with mental illness, you're not used to hearing about bipolar, you're not used to even hear about depression, and then suddenly you got schizophrenia on the line, it, I feel like that can really scare a family. Do you think that the number one reason that people are scared of schizophrenia is its link to violence in, you know, pop culture and the media in the minds of the public? Yes. I think it's just, and I always say this, that schizophrenia, it is just a scary sounding word. It has a Z in it. Like, it just sounds like, oh my gosh, like, it's just so great. Like, if I'm writing a movie, like, oh man, I'm going to have the character say schizophrenic or schizophrenia, and it's just automatically like, whoa. 
And I'll even have people try and combat me online and they'll say, well, you don't understand because most crime and whatnot, it's caused by people with mental illness and, you know, you have to be crazy to go and do all these bad things. And yes, I believe a lot of us just in the world, not me being a lot of us schizophrenics, but a lot of people in the world, we do suffer from different things. You know, if you are in a relationship and you get your heart broken, you're probably going to have some depression. It might not be long-term depression, and it could be just related, and it might have, you know, ease up after a few months, but you're going to go through some sort of mental situation that is not just optimal mental health. However, when you have crime, I think an easy way to just explain it is say, oh, they were crazy. Oh, they had schizophrenia. Let's ignore the fact that they were on drugs. Let's ignore the fact that they've already (laughs) shown issues with, let's say, beating their wife and things like that. No, it's because they have schizophrenia. There's no other health issue that automatically is linked to violence the way mental illnesses are. I have often postulated that one of the reasons that people are so quick to believe this is because extreme violence, I I mean, your, your, your mass shootings, your you know, even just murder in general, it it is so far outside of the realm of what a typical person is comfortable doing. I understand why people are like, well, doesn't that have to be mental illness? I mean, taking somebody's life is extreme. I mean, it's just really, really extreme. There has to be a component of mental illness in there. But that's not actually what we're talking about here. We're, We're talking about does schizophrenia make you kill people? Does it make you hurt people? Is there something innate about the illness that violence is a likely outcome? And that's where it gets tricky, right? Because nobody is saying that people with schizophrenia have never committed a violent crime. Correct. You're just saying that the majority of people with schizophrenia have never committed a violent crime. Yes. When you have people with mental illness, or you're specifically talking about schizophrenia, and, you know, no, the majority of us don't hurt anyone. You're like, well, Rachel, I mean, but some of you do. That still sounds scary. But not all husbands beat their wives. Some of them do, but not all of them. And that's not going to keep me from getting married. That's not going to keep me and or most people from finding a husband. But when it comes to mental illness, we've decided that somehow that connects, that All violence is caused by people with schizophrenia, and that that connection just doesn't exist in any study that's been looked at. And it's kind of scary that people are so desperate to believe it. Why do you think that people want to believe this so much? I think one of the main reasons is just being able to say somebody who did this horrible thing has mental illness. It makes you feel safer, okay? So I don't know anyone personally like that, so I I can feel safe. And if I ever met anyone like that, I could obviously tell, you know, they're like twitching and screaming and things. That's the person I should be scared of. You know, you hear these horrible stories of like a disgruntled employee who comes in and unfortunately does something, you know, very violent at the office. And a lot of times they're like, well, so-and-so, he was suffering from depression for so long. Well, you know, he was being treated by a psychiatrist. It's never, oh, he broke his leg last year. (laughs) You'd be like, like, what about him breaking his leg? And even in the cases of schizophrenia, the, the very, very, very tiny percentage of people with schizophrenia that do have a dangerous or violent outcome, they're almost universally uncared for or untreated. Yes. They're almost always left to their own devices with a very, very, very serious illness that isn't being maintained or managed. And many times that's unfortunately being self-managed by taking illegal drugs. So that plays a big part in it also. When we talk about mental health, mental health is for everybody. Like that's just a blanket term for all of us. And too many people hear it and think, oh, well, you only need mental health if something's wrong with your head. And it's not. It's working too much, you know, that work-life balance with your family. It's being able to enjoy being out with people. Like, mental health is so many things. It's not just dealing with disorders. But to bring it back around to schizophrenia, another thing that comes up a lot is that people say that people with schizophrenia are trying to get away with the bad things that they do. And this always sort of devolves into a guilty by not reason of insanity defense. 
that, that we, we can't trust people with schizophrenia because after all, even if they severely hurt, attack, maim, whatever somebody, they'll just be set loose tomorrow because they'll plead not guilty by reason of insanity. And that's why we have to crack down on this problem. H how do you feel about that? First, I think, I mean, I watch tons of the judge shows, as you know. I'm a huge Judge Judy fan, although I rarely hear the insanity defense used on her show. But still, huge, <laughs> just love court dramas and whatnot. And all the time, we hear the insanity defense. Okay, if you're watching Law & Order SVU, like, that's a lot of the times what they end up going with. In reality, though, it's not as common. It's actually used in less than 1% of U.S. cases. So this isn't something that's constantly being thrown out is the insanity defense. Well, oh, I couldn't have done this. Oh, I didn't do this because of. It's a very small percentage that actually use this defense. And of that, it only has a 26% success rate. And 90% of that 20%, those people were already diagnosed. So it means that was somebody who already had a diagnosed mental disorder and something happened. And to be clear... Those people don't then just go home. They're not back out in the community and in the public. They go to state hospitals rather than prison. Yes. So the best outcome for a not guilty by reason of insanity defense is that you go to a state mental hospital versus state prison. So pop culture has sort of misled us on this one again, where again, I think that the average person believes that you plead not guilty by reason of insanity and then you go home and nothing happens. Or I think the other I hear is, oh, they'll go to like a hospital for a few months. As if that's it. Three months instead of a life in jail. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. It is true that somebody may get out of a state hospital before they would get out of a state prison sentence, for example. But it's very, very rare that it's used. That's number one. It's not successful three out of four times. And when it is successful, it's, it's a very high threshold to be met. So that's probably not the worst thing. As you said, this happens all the time on Law & Order. It's always the twist in the, in the, in the courtroom dramas, etc. And maybe television isn't the best place to get information about how life with schizophrenia works. No. Going back to stigma being not knowing, though, most people don't actively seek to learn. You know, we're given all this media, and that's just what they consume. So that's what I believe to be true. It seemed like it was a really true movie I saw. They had, like, a judge. It seems right. Let's switch gears slightly. Everything that you just said was about fictional movies. You know, you're talking about, you know, your courtroom dramas and your reality TV. I mean, stuff that I think the average person really should understand is fictional. But now let's talk about media portrayals. This is the news. This is the, the, the evening news, the primetime news. This is expected to be factual. And one of the things that we hear about on the news all of the time, especially in the wake of some national tragedy, you know, a mass shooting, for example, is the term paranoid schizophrenia. This happened because of paranoid schizophrenia. It is almost a verbatim headline for many, many examples of violence and schizophrenia. Yes. Um, it's like if you have schizophrenia, that's bad. But paranoid schizophrenia... Well, that's just give up. That's the worst. That's also my official diagnosis. However, they do not use those subtypes anymore. That was dropped in 2013. But as someone who has a piece of paper that says paranoid schizophrenic on it, it's unnerving to me to hear it in the news because I just like my heart drops every single time. And you'll hear them, especially, I always think of James Holmes. He was the guy with the uh, the Batman movie who went in and unfortunately shot up a theater. And we all got to see him on TV and he had like orange hair, not helping, okay? And he like, has this crazy look in his eyes and we find out he mailed out um, things to the school counselor and it was just like telling everyone he was crazy. He actually used the insanity defense and he was still found to be legally sane. And he is someone who... They're flat out saying, this guy was a paranoid schizophrenic. The court said, but that didn't cause him to do all this. So even though like that diagnosis is slapped on things, there's probably a lot of other diagnosis. We could probably also say he was depressed. We could probably also argue the fact that he had just failed out of college. That pushes a lot of people over the edge. We could probably argue the fact that he was an extreme comic book nerd, which 
as a comic book nerd also, I wouldn't want to go down that route. But I know like a whole bunch of like little basement people just gasped. That was one of the things that came out during the media coverage, just how much time he spent alone reading comic books and how much he loved comic book culture and superhero culture. Yet, Marvel movies are still wildly successful. The most successful comic book franchise ever. Because when people said that this one person consumed a lot of comic books and then was violent and, you know, committed a mass shooting in a theater, people didn't say, oh, well, we have to be worried about all people who read comic books. No, people understood that that was this person's story, not everybody's story. Again, it's it's not the same way people think about schizophrenia. And as you said, schizophrenic, schizophrenia, it sounds like a scary word. And then you put paranoid in front of it. Well, we all know that paranoia is bad. <laughs> You're a paranoid schizophrenic. And you can see why people are drawn to these stories. Here in a few moments, we're going to talk to police officers about what they see, because they're the first responders for, for people who are having a crisis because of mental illness. How do you think that their comments are going to line up with how you feel? And as a person who lives with schizophrenia, how do you feel about the police knowing that in general society is blaming people with schizophrenia for large amounts of violence? Well, first, I do want to make it known, if you weren't sure, that I am a white female. I'm 5'7", so taller than some women, but yeah, not like freakishly towering over everybody. And all of my encounters with police, for the most part, have really been good. I've never had the police called on me over any issues. Uh, the only time I've called the police have been situations where things have happened. Twice when someone was having a heart attack in front of me and I called 911. And the, they were not coming for me. They were immediately rushing in to save the guy both times. So it's hard for me to kind of fully, to fully express how I feel because I know so many other people have different interactions with the police. And I'm very lucky that I have not been in situations where, you know, no one called the police on me and said, hey, there's this crazy girl outside my house and she's screaming up to the, the sky. My grandfather had Alzheimer's and the neighbor, before it got, we realized how bad it was, the neighbor called her boyfriend who was away at work and said, I'm really scared. There's an old man out here and he's screaming at the house and he wants us to turn the lights on to the night sky. And she was terrified. And we're just very blessed that she called her boyfriend and the boyfriend immediately called us as opposed to calling police. And I can only imagine if they would have pulled up with my grandfather out there, you know, not understanding that the lights aren't off. It's just nighttime. And we were able to calm him down. I know people rolling up to him as police officers would not have calmed him down. I mean, he's a 90 year old World War II veteran. I, I imagine he would have like dove in there, fists up swinging. Um, so... I don't want to just be like, oh, well, it's going to be great for everybody because it's not. And I personally have not had a situation where I've been at, let's go with receiving end of the police being called on me. Please pay attention to this information from our sponsor. It can sometimes feel like another schizophrenia episode is just around the corner. In fact, a study found that patients had an average of nine episodes in less than six years. However, there's a treatment plan option that can help delay another episode, a once-monthly injection for adults with schizophrenia. If delaying another episode sounds like it can make a difference for you or your loved one, learn more about treating schizophrenia with once-monthly injections at oncemonthlydifference.com. That's oncemonthlydifference.com. Thank you for listening to our sponsor's message, and we're back talking about violence and schizophrenia. Rachel, before we bring on our guest, I, I just have one big, big question to ask you. Have you ever been violent because of schizophrenia? I have been violent. I have not ever been violent because of my schizophrenia. The closest I would say that had to do with my schizophrenia was, as a teenager, me getting just upset, not really understanding what was going on, and my father trying to control me and not physically harm me in any way, but yes, trying to physically control me, like kind of grabbing me and me thrashing and becoming violent towards him at that moment. Again, not physical abuse really on either side, but it was just like me reacting to him grabbing me, trying to control me, where I was, you know, moving erratically, screaming, 
at the time he thought that's what he needed to do. And then I flipped out even more. Those are the only times I can think of in my life where the schizophrenia and the violence was connected at all. I'm real big into boxing. I have an incredible amateur competitive rate of zero one. <laughs> I, I don't think when people consider violence, they consider combat sports the type of violence that we're talking about. I, I mean, I yes, I, I know that you also wrestle alligators and you're a stunt woman and you set yourself on fire. And, and I, I understand that you can make an argument that those are violent acts, I suppose. But I mean, sincerely, have you ever flipped out at a mall? Have you ever started throwing things at people? Have you ever attacked a stranger? Have you ever been unable to control your own body in a way that was physically dangerous to those around you? I have not. No, I'm 33 years old and it's never been an issue for me and I don't foresee it becoming an issue with me. For our guest today, we are excited to have Senior Police Officer Rebecca Skillern. Rebecca, tell us a little bit about your training, your experience, what it is that you do. I am the Senior Trainer within the Mental Health Division at the Houston Police Department and myself along with my two co-trainers provide the crisis intervention training within our department and also to outside agency personnel. Now the crisis intervention training, I, I think a lot of people might be more familiar with its acronym CIT. Can you explain when somebody hears CIT kind of what that means for a police department? A large portion of what CIT means is that we provide specialized training for our personnel so that when they encounter people who are having mental health crises, they can better and more humanely respond to those individuals so that we work to get them into appropriate treatment and care rather than criminalizing their behavior and putting them in jail, which is not helpful to them. I had no clue that a police department would have an entire section for mental health. Is that common with police stations or bigger cities? It is, I wouldn't say common, but it is becoming more common. Uh, it is something that's been in the making within our police department for, or going on three decades now. And it's something that we have built over the course of time. It certainly didn't happen overnight. It's something that smaller agencies are still working to establish. And a lot of agencies, both within Texas and outside of Texas, are working to establish mental health units or sections within their departments to better respond and, and to also train their officers and other personnel so that they can keep them safer when they respond to these situations. How is a mental health division or crisis team of that sort, how is that a different response than, let's say, a normal police response? Traditional police responses include kind of a, a fact-finding mission. You get in, you get the information, you settle it and you move on and, and you get back into the call for service loop and continue to respond to criminal activity. We work in a different world today where there are a lot of other elements that do not or should not involve making arrests. When people go into crisis, for instance, people don't pick up the phone and call their therapist. They pick up the phone and call 911. You know, if a family member is um, losing control and they've been diagnosed with a serious mental illness, even sometimes when they've not yet been diagnosed, but when things are getting out of hand, people are calling 911. They're not calling the local mental health authority. They're not calling the, the person's psychiatrist. They're calling the police because they're scared and they want help. What we're doing with crisis intervention is we're training police officers to better be able to recognize those situations for what they truly are. And in essence, it, we refer to it as officer safety training because with officers being more educated about what they're dealing with, they are able to remain safer. They are also able to better de-escalate the situations and get the people who are in crisis into appropriate care and treatment rather than putting them in jail. One of the things that you said is that you're working to help decriminalize mental illness, but you are still the police force. So I think it creates maybe some confusion in the community that, hey, if the police are coming and somebody has mental illness, ipso facto mental illness is criminal behavior. Can, can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Because I know that the public can be very confused about what it means to live with mental illness. The public is very confused about what it is uh, or what it is like to live with mental illness. Many of the people who have mental illness live their lives every day. They're managing their illness and they are doing what they need to do to take care of themselves and there's not a problem. 
where it becomes a problem where law enforcement gets involved is when they're not able to manage it as well as some of their, their counterparts and people get scared. The bottom line with law enforcement is we're here to protect and serve. It's not just about making arrests. It's sometimes protecting people from themselves, sometimes protecting people from their family members. Uh, we do get called when people go into crisis and we do respond to those situations because we are trying to protect the community. We're trying to protect individuals from self injurious kinds of behaviors as well. And so we do get called for things like that and we do respond to things like that. And we want officers to be better capable of handling those situations and to verbally de-escalate rather than having to engage in like hand-to-hand -hand combat with people. We want them to be able to use their verbal skills. We also want them to be able to identify situations where they can get someone into a, a treatment regimen rather than in, into the criminal justice system. It takes a lot more and is much less economically responsible to try to treat someone in the, the criminal justice system than it would take or be to treat someone within the community. Okay. I, I love that answer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question. I do have schizophrenia. That is what this whole podcast is about. Um, and I have different, you know, yes, I have depressive type um, episodes that I go through, psychotic episodes. So let's say that I'm scared I'm going to hurt myself or I'm scared I might, you know, hurt somebody else. And it's a pretty intense feeling and what would you suggest I do right away? What do like, what is my protocol for how I should react? If you are in imminent danger of hurting yourself or someone else, I would suggest that you call 911 and that you ask for a crisis intervention trained officer to respond to you. I would also encourage you to make sure that you are not near any kind of weapons and would want to make sure that when you do, you, you let them know what you're wearing, that you don't have any weapons, that you respond well, to, if you respond well to a certain kind of approach, let them know that as well. If you don't respond well to a certain kind of approach, let the call taker know that. You know, I need someone to come out here who's not going to, to use loud voices, is someone who's going to be able to be calm. Someone who's trained in crisis intervention would be ideal. Uh, I don't have any weapons, but I, I am having thoughts of hurting myself and or someone else, and I need help. Okay. When I was reading about the training and what you all do as far as like telling people how to prepare, I guess, for the police coming, was right. once they turn on all the lights in the house. Yeah. I just thought I, that never occurred to me to do that. But yeah, I could see that being really important because I'm usually creeping around in the dark unfortunately <laughs> I like have yeah the light slow and I don't know that just had never occurred to me I thought that was interesting right have the lights on make sure if you have any pets that you have them secured so the officers aren't going to have to contend with that uh, it would also be important to make sure that you don't run up to the officers and that when the officers approach they can see your hands so that they can make sure that there aren't any weapons in your hands and, and feel confident with that uh, it's sometimes easier said than done when you tell someone to please stay calm, especially if they're actively hallucinating and delusional. You know, a lot of times there will be a theme with people who, who experience psychosis that the government is out to get them. You know, it's real important to reassure yourself they're here to help, they're here to help, they're here to help. And to repeat that out loud to them sometimes too, uh, because officers, like anybody else, are human beings, and they may become reactive if, if they're caught off guard. Um, I understand you're here to help. Here's what I need. Here's what's going on. You know, please help me because I don't want to act on this. I don't want to do anything, but, you know, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. So just to be forthright with what there is and also to identify if you have a diagnosis to say, I have a diagnosis. And this is the medication I'm supposed to be taking. And, and hopefully they will ask questions like, when was the last time you had your medication? Have you had any breakthrough symptoms? You know, hopefully they will have been through the training and, and know the follow-up questions to go through as well. But if they don't, be prepared to offer that information, even if you're not asked. 
I really like, of course, all of this information, and I think it's all very, very helpful. But as you kind of alluded to, it's going to be a tall order for somebody who's in crisis, hallucinating and experiencing symptoms that are so intense that, you know, they needed to call 911. So it sounds like this this involves training, you know, maybe the people that you live with or your family or your friends or your support staff. Do you have any advice for you know, how somebody living with schizophrenia can help their loved ones understand that it would be very beneficial that if they do need to call 911, they say all of those things other than listening to this podcast. Right. We actually, at the Houston Police Department, we worked with our local mental health authority and we put together a mental health emergency assistance guide, which is a one page form. One side is English, one side is Spanish. And it gives basic information like this with, with contact numbers, but it also says when calling 911, here's what you should do. And when law enforcement arrives, here's what you should do. The other piece is that I would highly recommend that family members be part of the treatment team, be part of that support system, learn about the illness, you know, attend NAMI, attend the family to family meetings to become educated themselves, because oftentimes family members can be the biggest hindrance to getting the person help. And oh, yeah. we, we encourage family members, look, if you have a family member who's experiencing this in his or her life, then become educated about it, because it's going to be a, a very important piece for you to help that person manage their, their situation. Help your family member by becoming educated, by knowing what to say when you call and ask for help, by uh, even even the individual, him or herself, can write the basic information down on a piece of paper so that if they do go into crisis and a person, you know, comes to, to respond to a call, a law enforcement officer responds to the call, they can hand them that piece of paper. They may not be able to communicate exactly what's going on with them in that moment in time, but if they have that piece of paper, they can hand it to them and say, here, you know, read this, and it'll give the officer some information about what might be going on with the person. Got it. So thank you. Thank you. In our society, unfortunately, the term schizophrenia gets kind of thrown around a lot on people who necessarily don't have it. We have um, all the issues, obviously, with school shooters and different things. And then everybody who's ever taken a psychology class suddenly can diagnose people. Looking right. at all of that, I say in the media in general, it's made people really scared of the word schizophrenia and hearing that somebody has it. Do you think with all of your training that schizophrenics are responsible for just all of this violence in society? Absolutely not. In fact, that's one of the biggest misnomers and one of the, the biggest things that kind of drives the stigma associated with mental illness is that people don't know. In fact, they're ignorant, but ignorance is something we can educate and, and get rid of. People with mental illness are no more likely to be violent than the average person. In fact, statistics show that people with, with mental illness are probably more likely to be victimized rather than perpetrators of crime. The stigma is one of the many things we work to try to educate amongst our law enforcement uh, personnel so that we get rid of some of those false beliefs. They're false beliefs, not based on fact. Thinking that people with mental illness are more violent than the average person is just something that's clearly someone not being educated. The media does not do justice to mental illness because they do often portray people with mental illness to be much different than what the reality is. You look at movies like Split or Shutter Island or, or something like that, and people get this idea that someone with schizophrenia it has to be completely out of it in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, when that is just certainly not the case. More often than not, people with schizophrenia or major depression or bipolar disorder can be you know, productive contributing members of society given the opportunity and having the people around them who support them and learn to understand how the illnesses affect a person. Awesome. Thank you very much for that response. That's wonderful. Thank you. So I don't live in Houston. How do I find out about my local law enforcement agency's protocol when it comes to a mental health crisis? I would recommend calling them. Call and find out, do you have a crisis intervention team? Do you have a police and mental health collaborative program in helping train 
the personnel on your department in how to better respond to people with mental illness. Uh, is there a PMHC in essence? Is there a police mental health collaborative? Do your officers receive something beyond the, the basic mandated training or is it optional or is it mandatory for them to get fully trained in crisis intervention so that they can offer a more humane response to people who are living with mental illness? Okay, Wonderful. Awesome. I really like what you said about, you know, listen, the police are there to serve and protect, not just to, you know, track down criminals or, or arrest people. They're, they're there to help people who are in need. And that goes along with that. You know, if you have a question about your local police force, we should be empowered to call up and ask, you know, ask the question, ask about CIT, ask about mental health training, ask about the things that we need. And if they don't have it in your area, you know, advocate for those services because it's 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 probably a you found that it's been vital, that it's been vital and helpful in Houston. Absolutely. And it, it's a strong selling point to law enforcement agencies to help them understand that it's just as much about officer safety as it is about keeping those in our community safe. Having the training so that an officer is better capable of understanding and identifying what they're dealing with when they encounter someone is priceless. You know, having that available to your personnel, which keeps them from encountering situations you know, full force, hands on, you know, straight off the bat, and instead teaching them verbal de-escalation skills and how to pay attention to the signs and symptoms that may be vividly present that they don't recognize or they don't understand. Because mental health is not traditional for law enforcement training. And getting training around mental health issues is not something that is part of your standard law enforcement training protocol. Although it should be, especially in today's world, because more and more people are going into crisis and officers are the ones responding to those crises. And it's much better if they go in knowing what they're dealing with than if they go in cold turkey, not understanding it and just see it as a fight. Got it. Got it. Well, I definitely have to thank you so much for coming and talking on our podcast today. Uh, very awesome information. And it's really nice to know from somebody who has a serious mental health disorder, it's nice to know that there are people working in the police department trying to, I don't want to say learn more about me, but, um, you know, learn the best ways to address these different kind of crises that might come up. Right. Well, Rachel, I, I want to applaud you as well, because you represent a very large portion of our community. It, you're, it's not just you. One in four people will experience some form of mental illness at some point within their lives. You're not just a small portion or a token portion of our community. You are our community as well. Awesome. Wonderful. You feel all warm and fuzzy. Thank you. You should, Rachel. You are incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being here and agreeing to do this and helping to get the word out. We really appreciate you so much for coming and talking with us today. It's so rare that you get to talk to a law enforcement official like this and really kind of learn the other side of things. So thank you so much. That was really great for them to come on here and talk with us, really giving us a side to the police and how they operate that you normally don't get to see or know about. It is true that a lot of people living with schizophrenia feel, a lot of people living with mental illness feel fearful of the police. So it's wonderful when, you know, people like Officer Rebecca can help us and talk to us and give us information so that both sides can get what they want, which is for all of us to be safe. Which kind of leads me to a question that I have for you, Rachel. We talked about what police officers really need and want so that police officers can feel safe and, and get the best outcome. You know, great information. But as the person living with schizophrenia, what do you want to have happen? I mean, other than the police not need to be called, but the police need to be called, a, a crisis has occurred, and you're involved, Rachel, so this is, you can only answer from yourself. Mm -hmm. What do you want? What do you want to have happen? For me watching various, you know, we have so many people now that whenever there is a police altercation, there's someone somewhere filming it. Whether we're saying, you know, someone's chest cam or a police officer or just someone standing by filming the situation. And a lot of the ones that I've watched online, I feel like that the officers come off very aggressive right off the start. Whereas if you're already kind of mentally off, and if you can tell this person may be causing a disruption, but they aren't like 
they don't have a gun or a knife, they're not actively hurting anybody, is to come up a little bit calmer. I know that whenever I'm mentally off, everything is more intense. So if you get mad at me, I'm going to think it's like 10 times worse than it is. If you're hollering at me, it's almost like I can't take the noise is so loud. Um, and I kind of freak out. When I was a teenager, it was just everything would become too much. And I would be hallucinating. I would be getting confused. And my dad <laughs> would get, you know, angry, not understanding this. And again, grab me. But I, everything was just too intense. So I would just react. So a lot of it is just knowing to interact with somebody who is in a psychotic episode or a mental health crisis calmly, doing your best to stay calm. You're really a, a big proponent of, of de-escalation. Yes, I'd much rather have someone calm me down, uh, kind of back off away from me even, but just kind of let the situation calm, even maybe let it I don't want to say get it out of my system because we're not talking about a violent situation getting out of my system, but just that energy. Okay, and letting everything calm down for a second. And to me, I usually, once everything else is calm, I, you know, slowly start to kind of chill out too. And okay, no one's trying to hurt me. I'm safe. And if you're out there and you're thinking and you don't have schizophrenia or a mental disorder, you might be like, well, Rachel, you should have known you were safe or whatever. But no, a lot of times I have my hallucinations. I'm seeing very scary things. I'm hearing very confusing things. And I don't necessarily know that I'm safe. And if on top of that, I got someone trying to grab me, it's, it's horrifying. So just being able to do whatever you can to just calm the situation, it works great. It's an interesting point that you just sort of raised there where you said, you know, I'm not calm. I'm not in my right mind. I'm in crisis because of schizophrenia. And then I have somebody try to grab me. Your exact words were somebody tried to grab me with everything that's going on. You might just think that you're in danger. You might not realize that it's a police officer. You might not realize that it's somebody who's trying to help you. And this is where we sort of get into the nuanced discussion about schizophrenia and violence. Because, for example, if a police officer tries to bear hug you to keep you safe, and then you punch that police officer, that will be seen as violence against a police officer, assault on a police officer. But from your perspective, from the perspective of somebody who's not in their right mind, somebody who's living with schizophrenia, you're just trying to defend yourself and get away because you feel deeply, deeply threatened. You're not actually trying to harm a police officer in any way. Do you think that that's some of the misunderstanding when it comes to why people are so afraid of people with schizophrenia and why you may be accused for so much violence? Yes, on some level, definitely not all of it. To kind of give you an idea, though, I mean, I've had times where I didn't recognize my mom. So, yeah, I totally might not recognize that this person dressed in all black, similar to my hallucinations, which are usually black figures, is, you know, somebody good. All right, I might not realize that this is a good person or this is a helpful person coming to assist me or assist those around me by helping me get under control. And I just might react wrong. That's why I'm so glad we have these crisis intervention teams where police are learning to tell the difference between somebody who is actively violent trying to hurt others and somebody who is in the middle of a mental breakdown and can't understand what's going on around them. One of the things that we heard the officer say is that people with schizophrenia are in fact not responsible for all of the violence and in fact not even responsible for most of it or even a significant portion of it. As somebody who lived with schizophrenia... How did that make you feel to hear police acknowledge this? When uh, Senior Officer Skillern brought that up, it makes me feel really good to know that not just advocates of schizophrenia, people who work in mental health care, people with family and friends of schizophrenics are the only ones that are working to make a difference. That it's even the police officers that are working to make a difference in this kind of, this issue alone of violence and schizophrenia. Um, that they're actually like, hey, we're the ones who respond to the violence. So we know firsthand and know it is not just about having schizophrenia is what makes somebody violent. When we were putting this show together, I think one of the most interesting things is when we were looking for a police officer to speak with us, they came from Houston, Texas. Um, I kind of was thinking maybe it'd be a more liberal type state like California or maybe even like up in New York that have started this program. Or like a small town where, yeah, there's not many of us, so it's pretty easy. You know, I 
there's only five police officers and only 20 people in the town. Um, but this came from like Houston, Texas, where you think of, you know, everybody gets a gun, cowboys, Walker, Texas Ranger. And that's really awesome because they see the value in it, even while still being tough on crime. I couldn't agree more, Rachel. And, and I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't surprised, too. And it's nice to know that crisis intervention training exists. And I really like what Officer Rebecca said when she said, look, the, the role of police is not to enforce laws. The role of police is to keep people safe. And I think that that's a, a message that really needs to get out there more, because I think when we're talking about misunderstandings in the general public, the role of policing and the role of law enforcement might be misunderstood as well. And I think it does come to the detriment at people with mental illness and of people with schizophrenia. So I'm, I'm glad that she was here. Yes, she was awesome. This has been Inside Schizophrenia. Thank you so much for listening to us. Like, share, subscribe, and thank you for tuning in. Inside Schizophrenia is presented by PsychCentral.com, America's largest and longest operating independent mental health website. Your host, Rachel Starr Withers, can be found online at rachelstarlive.com. Co-host Gabe Howard can be found online at gabehoward.com. For questions or to provide feedback, please email talkback at psychcentral.com. The official website for Inside Schizophrenia is psychcentral.com is. Thank you for listening, and please share widely.